Oh, okay, now it's recording. <laughs> Once again, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I, some of you have asked me questions over email and some ask questions during the, you know, the end of the talk. And we could start with questions or we could have me um, just carry on. But for those of you who ask questions, I took time last night to pull up a, a bunch of figures. Now they're not in my talk, um, but for instance, and Margie, if I say your name wrong, forgive me. You know, I pulled up, well, I have my leg tang and ink folder open and I pulled up my ping of the thermal structure. It'd be nice if I showed it to you in MATLAB and had a big fig, but it was a question of, you know, Margie's question was, are tropical lakes always meromictic? And I'm assuming you mean the really deep ones. But anyhow, there's questions like that that people have asked, and I could carry on with my talk, but if you wanted it to be a little bit more freeform, we could start that way. I, I leave that to you guys. Okay, so I'm not hearing an answer, so I'm gonna carry on. Um, and I'm happy to see that Hans Peter is here because at the end of this talk, I begin to ask the question that I knew would be of interest to him, you know, and this is about the oxic methane production versus lateral transport. Okay, so, so I'm going to carry on. I'll, let's see if I can share my screen. And yeah, look at that. And oh my, is this going to be messy because I'm going to show all the windows. But that means that I'm going to be able to um, well, no, it didn't let me. Well, anyhow, what can I say? So I ended a little bit, it gets a little jumpy here because of extra time yesterday. So I showed some movies a little out of context. Um, and then this is a little thing I developed about complex stratification. And I don't really want to start with that. But I, I put this one back in, in the line, and that is, do line linear waves induce resuspension? And it could be important for fluxes from sediments. And this is a, a slide given to me by Leon Bogman. And I know that many of you, like even going back to this methane flux or oxygen flux, this whole issue of what would make a lake become anoxic in the lower water column? What might increase the flux of methane? You have to remember the methane is dissolved in the sediments. You know, it's produced microbially. And then if there's a, a flux out of the sediments, now you could increase that loading. Or you could bring up more reduced species from the sediments, and then they would interact with the oxygen and have a tendency to bring it down. So this picture, I didn't even have a chance to go back and and look at this paper, all right? But these are, so I'm inferring, of course, from the, you know, I asked Leon for up-to-date slides for a talk a few years ago, but the bottom, you can see what they're calling echo intensity. So that's backscatter. And then the above is temperature, and you see the waves, and you see them increase in magnitude. And you can see how there's an increase in this echo intensity, which is then indicative of some sediment resuspension, right? So all of you can, not all, but I'm looking at a few people whom I know, immediately are gonna think about what reduced species are in those sediments and what might come up, right? So I, I just wanted to get this out here on the table for you all to see. So we looked at the Cayuga Lake and the Mono Lake didn't run yesterday. So I'm not gonna try it again, but what I, I want to point out to you is Mono is a 100, 150 square kilometer lake. I'm trying to think right now how big Lake Geneva is, knowing that Jorah's there. And <laughs> and, you know, it's not coming to me, although I've been. But you notice this sampling design, every one of those stations, every 12 of those stations is sampled every single day that it's a sampling day on the lake. And that's to take into account that there's spatial variability in your phytoplankton, in your thermal structure, where the internal waves are going to break, um, and the zooplankton. 
and in, and again, I'm not going to give a lecture on Mono Lake, which, by the way, is is in Meromictic Lake in some years, and then it shifts to Monomictic. But in talking about internal waves and if they're nonlinear, when they're going to break at a boundary and then have some of that potential nutrient flux depends on the slope of the bottom. So here you can see this one end of the lake. Um, it's a very gradual slope. This other end, it's much sharper. All along the island, it's really sharp. So for those of you who saw um, Elvis Droskar's movie of Lake Cayuga, when, when, the, um, when the wind blew and it set that thermocline in motion, when that thermocline went up, went over a sill, that's when you really set up a lot of internal wave activity. In our work, when we put thermistors here and here in the deep spot and here and here, the greatest nonlinearity and that some of the greatest mixing then occurs along these steeply sloped um, sides of the um, island and then over here where it's more steeply sloped. So again, if you're thinking, what's the effect of internal waves and primary productivity or Am I even getting my primary productivity numbers right, right? It becomes important to remember that you're going to need to sample not necessarily at one spot. And the little bit of data that I showed you from like N2 yesterday, and I'm going to show that movie again, it comes after this, um, a lot of spatial variability even in small lakes. So, so keep that in mind in your sampling, that one spot may just not do it all. But of course, one spot over 20 years may be incredible. So you've got to decide what's feasible, you know, based on your own resources. So I'll talk a little bit more about the relation of the lake number to greenhouse gas emissions. And I showed you the movie on Lake Cayuga. Um, I'm going to show you a really nice little picture from Tulik. And I'm going to give you more information on Lake Pleasant than you really want. But it's going to give you a a chance to actually see what we get when we actually go out and measure turbulence. And I'll, I'll just show that little scene from Lake N2 again. And we'll also get to the polymictic lakes that I know some of you are interested in. Anyhow, and Gerard, I know you weren't here. Um, and for anybody else, I've been spending a lot of time talking about Wedderburn numbers and lake numbers, which in many cases can be the same, but sometimes they're different. And what they tell us about the degree of of nonlinearity of waves and whether or not we're going to have intense mixing that might actually, you know, bring something from a hypolimnion up. Okay. And everybody else has already seen a number of pictures from, from Tulik Lake. But this is Tulik in the in 2015 in the summer. And once again, we almost always get our thermistors in pretty much right after ice off. I mean, this one looks a little bit Oh, I know why this is late. It was the earliest I saw here. Um, and, and we might have had a delay. But you can see the thermocline, and you can see the shallow mixed layer. And you see the thermocline descending over the summer, as happens in so many lakes. And then you see this plummet. And you could say, well, what made that happen? OK. And when I saw that, I did, I did, I've done three things. The first thing I said was, was it going to be from internal waves? How fast did it occur? Or was it because of cooling? So when we do our work, we always have you know, the MET stations out. We're always able to calculate latent and sensible heat fluxes in the total heat budget, which I know I haven't really discussed with you because then we would have needed more lectures. But I was able to figure out the amount of cooling and therefore term heat flux to, to buoyancy flux that could have potentially led to deepening of the mixed layer. Well, this deepening, by the way, is going from about five meters all the way to the bottom, okay, at 24. And the amount of deepening from the heat loss would only have been four meters. So this is a case when that lake number went down to 0.1, um, it caused all of those Kelvin Helmholtz billows that I showed you in that modeling um, done by Stashak, Lysenko, and Hutter. And recently, I pulled up this data set again. 
And I thought maybe I'd see a whole bunch of really cool waves or whatever, you know. <laughs> but it was pretty incredible because when I opened it up, it was just all the high frequency waves, small ones, indicative of Kelvin Helmholtz billows. And so that's what happened. The wind was strong enough relative to the stratification to mix this lake essentially uh, 15 meters over four days. Now, another thing I did just for the heck of it, I thought I gave you all some time scales. And I said a time scale of mixing is L squared over KZ. So in this case, I could see that this is mixed down in four days. So there was my time scale and it went 15 meters. So I did the inverse problem and calculated the eddy diffusivity. And interestingly, it was seven times 10 to the minus four meters squared per second. And I've told you that's fairly high. You know, once you're above 10 to the minus five, you're getting to be high, but it's not, you know, not 10 to the minus two. But anyhow, that was interesting. Um, and I don't have the time series of lake numbers, but it went down to the point one. So that means there was a huge amount of this internal wave sloshing and all those Kelvin Helmholtz billows. So this graph shows you the eddy diffusivities. So here in most of the summer, they're at what we call molecular values, 10 to the minus seven meters squared per second, uh, meters squared per second, yeah, that's right. And then all this red is really an overlay where I'm using um, the calculated turbulent velocity in the upper water column, which I get from the MET data, times the depth of the mixed layer. And I gave you that equation yesterday. And that's how I get the red. Um, and you can see that in the mixed layer, it's on the order of 10 to the minus three, maybe 10 to the minus two. And this little bit of yellow is what my heat budget curve gave. And see, it's just over 10 to the minus four. So the heat budget calculation was really pretty good for how fast um, this thermocline descended. Right? So that may be a little complicated to go over, but anybody could always write to me, Sally, could you explain that again? But now let's think, what did it mean in terms of properties? Okay. Also remember the little uh, vignette, I, I said, let's tell a story with data. And I was showing you data from Tulik in 2017, time series temperature, time series oxygen, time series of percent saturation. And then you saw, once again, towards the end of the summer, an event like this, and in the percent saturation, you could see that throughout the whole water column, it went down from the mixing, okay? Well, in this case, by 2015, we began to put platforms on the lake at the surface that measured CO2. And through most of the summer, the concentrations in the water were fairly near equilibrium. And here they are in micromoles. So it's just moving along and then bingo, as soon as we had that low lake number event, up went the CO2, right? So you know from one set of data, there's a drawdown in oxygen, the other one you see the CO2 come up. So you see this absolutely huge exchange between epilimnetic and hypolimnetic water. And I know that some of you are interested in regime change, which is part of what this talk is all about, but no one yet has built lake numbers into regime change. How frequently do we have events with low lake numbers or low Wedderburn numbers, which of course is tied to wind and stratification? And what does that mean for the evolution of lakes over time? But here you can see, for those who are studying gas flux, what a huge flux. And for people interested in methane, I can't remember right now if Tulik makes much methane in the summer. I don't really think it does. It does in the winter time. But if you're working in a lake that was um, more eutrophic or had greater particle loading, you might also have dissolved methane in the lower water column. And an event like this might be so fast that the gas could get the air water interface before it's oxidized. But you have to figure out how long does it take to get the air water interface and what are the rates of, of methane oxidation? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to Lake Pleasant, New York, where I showed you a movie the other day 
And I'm, I'm going to bet you might like to see it again because looking at movies helps develop intuition. And we instrumented a lake for meteorology, uh, temperature, CO2, and in fact, we're probably one of the first papers that had CO2 throughout the water column, throughout the whole experiment. Um, turbulence, as the rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy using the SCAMP. And then the data set shows upwelling when the lake number is less than one, which brings cold CO2 rich water into a shallower northern embayment. And thermals from cooling contribute to the erosion of stratification, and they bring CO2 to the air-water interface. So I'm going to show you that in data. And, and this slide probably looks horrific, <laughs> right? Because there's a huge amount of information in it. I'm going to talk you through it so you can help get some more intuition. And then we'll look at the movie, right? And remember, we're in the northern basin of, of this lake. So we have a W star, which some of you know is a convective velocity scale. It's telling you what's the magnitude of those turbulent eddies coming down from the surface. You know, how fast are they? And they're only present when, when the lake is actually cooling, right? When that sunshine, you know, the sun's not really shining. They might be there sometimes when it's cloudy, but that's cooling. And in black, I have the water friction velocity in meters per second. I think I hit the slide with the definitions of these before, but anyhow, it's proportional to wind speed, okay? Um, and then thermal structure, which we've been looking at a lot. So I'm only showing you two days of data and you get a sense of how dynamic a water column can be. So here's noon on that first day and it heated up and now the cooling begins, and then you can see those isotherms rise to the surface as we always see with cooling. And then the next day, it doesn't look like it was really all that sunny, another patch of heating. Again, the thermals rise under cooling. And then you can see, you can really see the seasonal thermocline here as it moves up and down. And here you can actually even see some of these nonlinear internal waves, small ones in this case, that I've been talking about that are going to be indicative of whether or not you'll have mixing. Here's another set. See how steep that is? You know, when you have a linear wave, it just oscillates. It's a real pretty clean signal. But when you have the nonlinear ones, they're always really sharp. And then I, I'm getting more technical here because it's the third day. Here we actually have a separation of isotherms like right there. And that tells a person like me, there's gonna be a jet of water going through, which also can contribute to mixing. But unlike in many studies, you know, a lot of times we have oxygen, but in this case, we actually have those continuous time series of CO2. And the concentrations here in parts per million by volume go from 600, so a little bit above atmospheric saturation and once again, I've modified the scale a little bit so you can see most of the colors, but this patch right here is going to have somewhat over 1800 parts per million by volume. So there's not too much under heating. And then under cooling, we begin to see the effects of entrainment, right? We can see that those eddies, they're penetrating into that seasonal thermocline and they're beginning to bring up the gases. And this, by the way, is a low value of a view star. I, I wish I put the wind speeds, but made this a while ago. Um, but it's not very high. It's, I'm not gonna guess right now, but I think it's a meter per second. And then this is gonna be about five meters per second. Okay, and then here we are, it's sunny and it's a little bit windy. We just said that's gonna be about five meters per second. And we don't actually see much change right, in, in the CO2 in the overlying water. And then because of that wind, we have a little bit more upwelling, okay? And now we get into the cooling period again, but we'd upwell a little bit more. And now as those eddies are penetrating into that seasonal thermocline, you can see how the concentrations of CO2 go up. You know, a lot of times people say, well, what's causing the mixing? Is it wind or is it cooling? One of these next slides is going to give you the answer, 
Okay, but you can see just at the first level that, oh, I hope I, oh, stepping back, remember, in a graph like this, the color tells you temperature, and the black are the isotherms, the lines of constant temperature. In this graph, we have the color is all the CO2, but all the lines are the isotherms, right? So see, these are the same as that, okay? Somebody else might have said, oh, I'll make the, uh, you, you know, the isoclines of, of CO2. But with this type of overlay, you get to merge the physics with the biogeochemistry in the same graph, okay? So that's why we do it like that. And you can see, oh yeah, the CO2 came up because we had upwelling. And oh, the CO2 is increasing in this water column because it's cooling and those eddies can go down and they can scoop into this, the you know, seasonal thermocline and bring up the dissolved gases. So the next two panels are the kinds of data that most of you don't get much of an opportunity to look at. And my intuition is that if you kind of sat down with a turbulence paper in front of you, you go, well, what is all this? And it, it might be a little bit daunting. Um, but the two panels, the upper one shows the rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy, which we always call epsilon. And again, I, I told you that there's kinds of numbers that we physical limnologists always memorize. And we know that something that's 10 to the minus nine is really small and above 10 to the minus six is actually really high. And this range in here is considered sort of moderate. Down below, I have a term which is called a centered overturn. And these ideas went back to Steve Thorpe. Okay, this way of approaching it. But you can imagine, well, this, this profile shows it right here. See how the temperature's right here at the very surface are colder than the ones immediately below. So when we calculate an, an overturn, we go, how far can this water fall, right? And see, you can see that the water here can actually fall 10 meters. So that's what this uh, term is, is giving you, the size of the overturns and the size of the turbulent eddies. And it's on a log scale going from one centimeter to 10 meters. And while we look at this, it could fall from the top down to there. What we do is we center the distance in the middle and we say 10 meters. So it always looks sort of bigger in the middle and smaller at the top, but it's telling you that this whole water column has turbulent eddies, which are on the order of 10 meters deep. And you can see right here how they're penetrating into that seasonal thermocline. So the patterns are real, they're very typical day to day whenever you have this type of data. Here's our cooling period. Here's these large eddies filling the upper mix layer. And then look, it's all blue here in this bit of the seasonal thermocline. All those eddies are on the order of a few centimeters, right? They're not gonna cause a whole lot of vertical transport. Then it's transition between cooling and heating for a little while, those eddies are going to persist, but then stratification sets up, and now the eddies become much smaller. Okay, but now the cooling period began again, and once again, the eddies are larger. So, what's different between here, it's a low U star, and here it's a higher one? We've got a combination now of wind and cooling, and it's enough that now these eddies are penetrating deeper into that seasonal thermocline. And as you could see, they're bringing up more dissolved gas. But the sort of surprise, you know, with the turbulence is, it's not necessarily high throughout the whole water column. Um, and some of you will have heard of wall to wall scaling, which sort of goes as the wind is blowing, it's gonna set up a gradient in, in currents, they'll be shear faster at the surface and then falling off. And so the velocities fall off with a gradient. That's how we get this term U star. It's indicative of that, of that gradient in, in velocity near the surface. 
And the dissipation rates also can follow a law of the wall scaling. So if it's at all windy, we would expect the turbulence to be higher at the surface, which you see here in all these graphs, right? So unfortunately, most of this is under cooling. It's cooling, but the turbulence itself is highest at the surface and then it decays. Here's this transition period. It's higher at the surface, even under a bit of cooling. And now see how when the wind picked up, that near surface turbulence increased. Okay, and that's because the shear, the currents are increasing near the air water interface. And I didn't see everybody who came in, but those people who are interested in gas exchange, this is becomes really super critical because once this turbulence begins to increase near here, because the gas transfer velocity depends on turbulence, this is a setup for an increase in fluxes to the atmosphere. Okay, now watch. The wind is still a little bit high, but now the wind begins to drop and it's cooling. So we have two things going on. This windier day, you can see that the mixing actually went into this, um, it went into the top of the seasonal thermocline and the CO2 is right below it. So even though there's a bunch of mixing there, you're not bringing up the gas. Now, with, with that stronger cooling, right, the gas is now starting to be entrained into the mix layer. Um, again, under cooling, right, and the wind is higher, higher dissipation rates. So anybody who's working on gas exchange problems can ask me for more details on that later. But a, a take home message here is that the magnitude of the turbulence tends to be much higher right here at the air water interface. Sometimes when we have the nonlinear waves, you'll see an increase in turbulence associated with those. And this graph doesn't show it perfectly. All right, so that may be a little bit more on what you wanted to see about turbulence or no, but the eddies are big at night and then you have that entrainment uh, or you can have entrainment from the seasonal thermocline and they're a lot smaller in the day, right? So if you bring up gas at night, which uh, we did a little bit here, as that wind increases in the day, it can now let that gas, which was mixed up at night, vent to the atmosphere. So the Tchaikovsky et al. paper actually shows that, and the Tedford et al. actually shows how we go from dissipation rates to gas transfer velocities. And you may have questions, but I can't see anybody's hands go up. Alrighty, so I showed this movie before, the modeling of, of the lake done by Javier Vidal. Oh, darn, I hit the wrong spot. Okay. Okay, upper panel, um, wind speed, lower one, wind direction. And this one, again, for this methane question, although we weren't measuring methane in this lake, watch how fast when the wind comes up, the heat, gets blown over to one side of the lake. So it's it's kind of amazing. Oh, oh, this is the temperature side. This is CO2. Um, it's incredible when that wind comes up, just how fast the heat can go from, from one end to the other and accentuate it. It's really quick. Um, I may show this movie twice. I don't think I gave everybody a chance to really see what it's, what it's showing. Surface of the lake, temperature, surface of the lake CO2, temperature as a cross section through the lake, CO2 as a cross section through the lake, the measurements I just showed you of turbulence, and the CO2 concentrations were up here. So this movement near the bottom induced by the wind is what brings that CO2 as an upwelling to the place where we could see that it could be mixed up into the upper water column. Okay, let's watch this again, thinking, knowing there's a few people here who care about gas exchange. Okay, we start. Temperatures are relatively uniform. All right. The wind is going to begin to pick up, and you can see that the warmer water is, and the wind is in this direction, it's going over towards this, this shore, sort of northern, easterly, 
and then daytime heating, okay, the thermocline is going crazy with the wind. Now we push more warm water and the CO2 is coming as an upwelling here. I think it's the southeast side of the lake. And then you can see the eddies as it's moving across. So you can see that if you're going to be studying gas exchange, you need a lot of chambers or you really need to have an eddy covariant system here and here. Um, okay, let's watch again as the wind as the wind picks up, it's now coming a little bit out of the southwest. Okay, now it's reversing direction. And we once again have that upwelling here with these tendrils. And then what you see in this model is not that much of it even reaches the surface over here in the northern basin. Most of it stays here in the south. So anyhow, the bottom line is that exchanges between, um, it, yeah, it was a point I tried to make earlier. Lakes are not necessarily one dimensional. The upwelling can occur in one spot, may, and then that water might then move across to the other parts of the lake. But here you can see a lot of, a lot of the water that, uh, that was enriched in CO2 tended to stay more in this more southern basin. Okay, so now if you're really interested in phytoplankton ecology, you could say, well, those nutrients came up. And so one side of that lake might be more productive than another, right? So these are the, even though this is CO2, as you start to think, well, what other solutes could be in that deep water? Might we get a bloom? Might we spur a different type of microbial activity, right? Lots of questions you can get as you think um, as the lakes in a three-dimensional context. Okay, um, I showed you I showed you all this before. I'm watching my clock, and the bottom line here is at Lake N2, we got our measurements under the ice right before ice off, or actually we had thermistors under the ice throughout the whole winter, and because the water that comes in from snowmelt is super fresh. It creates a layer of less dense water here over the denser lake water, okay? Because the conductivity of snow melt is around 20 and the conductivity of the lake water is around 200 microsiemens per centimeter and the temperatures are cold. They're near the temperature of, of maximum density of, of um, fresh water. So density is really, really important in the equation of state under those conditions. So the effect then the ice is on the lake and you can see that that fresher water right under the ice actually accumulated a lot of heat and that can you know i've seen that in a number of lake studies now there'll be heat here then when the wind increased the ice went off and the wind increased here at one o'clock in the morning on day 149 and that heat then immediately got pushed down um, into you know down to about six meters of the 10 meter lake and still the same type of thing. Then it leveled off. The deeper water, right? This is what is anoxic and it is enriched in both methane and in CO2. Leveled off thermocline, but notice how the hypolimion ran up the side of the lake, right? And then we got another uh, burst of wind, tilted this thermocline, and this time the hypolimion ran the other way. I wanted just to show you this again because of the questions about Miramixis. This lake does have a little chemocline down here, and so it makes it a little tiny bit more stable to some of, of, of the uh, mixing that goes on when a Wetterberg number is less than one. So this lake stays stratified at ice off. It's much smaller than Tulik or E5. And I showed you for both of those lakes, the time series of Wedderburn numbers. And in colder years, they have many, many events where the uh, Wedderburn number goes down to around one. And so there's a lot of upwelling. But this lake, because it's smaller, we only get one or two such events over the summer. And therefore, the anoxia that, that was there at ice off persists into the summer period. And it really doesn't usually get vented until maybe halfway through the summer. 
So again, as you put on your thinking caps and you go, what are burn numbers? They're scale independent. This could just as easily be a larger lake in Europe, you know, knowing some of you are from Europe. And same type of thing where if that lake is strongly stratified, that bottom layer may not fully exchange or it, or if it didn't mix fully in the winter, the conditions in summer where you begin to mix heat down as here can allow this layer to persist. I might not have said that as well as I wanted to, but it's related to some of the questions I've gotten over, over the internet. So if there's any more question about that, ask me, but anyhow, the pushing, the rapid mixing down of the heat into this lake sets up stratification super fast after ice off so the anoxia persists and the greenhouse gases produced over the winter are largely retained. So I'm watching my clock. I'm only going to talk about Lake St. Augustine. I'm going to rush through and not show a bunch of cool slides that I put together for Lake Paranapatinga. Um, somebody could ask me about that later if there's time. But Lake Polymictic um, Lake St. Augustine, you can see it's about a four meter deep lake. It's in Quebec. Um, you know, it's in a cold part of the world, but look at these temperatures, right? Here's 28, there's 22. So in the summer, a lake like this can still get really hot. It has a wind field, you know, it goes up to six and down to around two and up to four and down to nothing and up and down. And then a little bit later, those winds tended to stay more below two or maybe three meters per second. Let's watch the lake numbers then. And I only showed you one small bit of this overall summer record. With that stronger wind, the lake number went down to 10 to minus two, and then it went up, and then it went down to 10 to minus one. So you can see then that the thermocline don't necessarily think at 10 to minus two means that the whole lake mix. We don't know that yet. But 10 to minus two, it's a lot of tilting of the thermocline and then a reset. And a lot of tilting of the thermocline and then a reset. And then it's sort of interesting because now, later, it's only going down to about a full upwelling, right? Exactly the full upwelling. But now let's watch what's going on with temperature. And we don't have the solar heating, and so there's some questions here, but we had the strong wind, the low lake number. And the way to think about it is the mixed layer has now reached the bottom where the thermistors are located. But as soon as that wind relaxes, as you see here with the lake number going up, and you can see here in the wind speeds, there's cold water at the bottom. So it's telling you as a thermocline tilted, the thermistors are where the mixed layers reach the bottom of the lake. But the hypolimnion, if we want to use that word for a polymictic lake, is over here. So when the wind relaxes, the cold water comes back, right? And the same thing happens over here on the next day. And I'm going to bet we had a little increase in solar radiation for these temperatures to go up the way they did. Um, but we're still seeing a deep push down where the thermistors are located, a deepening of the mixed layer, and then on relaxation of the wind, the hypolimnion returns. So again, in some of your lakes, that water, if it's, if it's a eutrophic lake, it may be anoxic or hypoxic. It may have high concentrations of phosphorus. It could have high concentrations of arsenic. Um, a lot of different things. Now, all of a sudden, the wind field decreased. And I really do think that the solar radiation was increasing. I didn't review the paper. Um, but now, even though we still see the downwelling in the day and internal waves upwelling at night, right? And now it's windy again, and we're pushing the heat down at the one end of the lake. The wind relaxes, we have another upwelling. What you notice is there's actually a little bit more of a persistent thermocline, right? This is the period right now when the cyanobacteria blooms begin in this lake. So you're still having somewhat low lake numbers, and I might have said, well, heck, there still should be a bunch of vertical mixing. But we weren't out there with the scamp. We don't know how intense any of that turbulence was. But we can bet we had more mixing and probably more alleviation of anoxia under these conditions. 
And then as things stabilized, we probably began to have less mixing. And then it was a setup, right, that the cyanobacteria um, could take over. There's actually a whole lot more to that story. Matchek really, um, oh, what a say which, he really has a really good grasp on biogeochemistry and algal physiology. Um, so there's a lot of neat stuff in that paper if you want to have a look at it. This next one, I'm going to just show you this one picture. It's another polymictic lake. Um, but sometimes, yeah, you, you know, some of us are working in constrained lakes. Tropical lakes can be really, really amazing. And those along the Amazon River, because the Amazon River goes up and down by about 12 meters every year, the lakes actually totally change um, in size from being small to being much larger. And I don't have a figure to show it, but the Amazon River is here. This is the lake. And the big lake is called Lago Grande de Curie. And if you have the bathymetry, you can actually see that this lake has multiple basins. And, and here you can just see how the river water breaches these levees, right? Because the lakes are defined by, by you know, land that goes up and trees grow on it. But at high water, then the river can go right over that land and flood some of those lakes. Um, and I, if anybody wants to stay later, we can get into these topics, which I find fascinating, but which I think we just don't have time to, to deal with right now. I'm going to try to finish the main parts of the talk so some of you can ask questions. Once again, we showed this the other day, Wedderburn number in these different ranges. And we said it's indicative of how much the thermocline is going to tilt and how much mixing would go on. Remembering in the first one right here, we have what they call wind stirring. And so it's just the winds that are, that are, are caused, it's just the currents caused by wind at the interface and you don't have much shear across the thermocline. But a lot of the mixing that allows exchange between the deeper water and the upper water column is when you tilt the thermocline and you get more shear across it. And that's a really important concept and it's also really important for those people who are working with one dimensional models, because a lot of them struggle to get this shear term correct. So if you are working with 1D models, it becomes super important to look at the observational data with the model data and go, gee, I wonder if I have this parameter set high enough, or gee, maybe I better talk to the programmer who wrote this and see if we can't tune up this year, okay, because that's a really, really hard problem. Anyhow, we've now talked about different lakes, and I showed you data from Lawrence Lake, which is an example of a small sheltered lake, but larger ones when it's not windier in the same regime. And then we talked about Tulik and E5, and they're both in this range. And then Tulik is also in this one, and Lake Cayuga, for which I showed you the movie, is in this range, and so is E5. And then we had a number of, of lakes, St. Augustine and Paranapatingo, and I didn't show you its data, where the Wedderburn number also goes in this range, Cayuga, Cayuga does, and two at Isoff. And Tulik, I showed you that incredible mixing that occurs um, when the Wedderburn no number went down to 0.1. So lakes will be in all these different ranges, but some of the times they're going to be up here with nothing going on, and some of the time they'll be in these other ones. So the biogeochemistry is going to depend an awful lot on how frequently you have shifts between the different regimes of the Wedderburn number. So with some of the topics we've talked about, here would be some ecological consequences of an internal wave regime. Down here, and again, for George, who probably didn't hear this talk before, 1 over W, that's 1 over the Wedderburn number. And it's actually this extent of deflection of the thermocline relative to the mixed layer depth. Um, and then depth of the mixed layer divided by the base of depth. So the more asymmetrical it is, the more likely you are to be in, that generate some of the nonlinear waves that go along with each of these regimes. So this one, the regime where waves are linear 
organisms tend to be layered. Your phytoplankton, your zooplankton, you just go up and graze them more readily. The fish can too. And the eddy-diffusivities are at molecular values. And the data I showed you for, on this case was Lawrence Lake. When we're in this regime, which is the one where the wet urban numbers are more likely between like three and 10, we have mixing in the boundary. Layers of phytoplankton can be disrupted. You might have local increases in primary productivity and the eddy diffusivities are probably gonna go above 10 to minus five meters squared per second. This regime where um, the wet urban number is less than one and one over it is becoming progressively larger, the mixing can be lake wide, right? Really big changes across the whole lake. And the KZ can go from 10 to minus five up to 10 to minus two. And I showed you a calculation for TULIC where it got up, what was it, seven times 10 to minus four. And then I told you, if you look at Duraskar and Bogman, you'll see that they even get up to 10 to minus two across that thermocline in Lake Cayuga. So all these various ecological processes depend on on you know, these eddy diffusivities and the mixing, the nutrient fluxes, the fate of inflows. You know, if a stream is coming in, is it being mixed as it comes in? Um, the rate of primary productivity, as it depends on nutrient and light supply, cyanobacterial blooms, species composition, and the fluxes of CO2 and methane. And now, you, you know, I can't believe I actually I, I know many of you are in, into regime change, and I actually first made this graph. I don't even want to tell you when, and I should have published a paper on it, but I never did. Um, regime shifts. Right here, I've put in some of the lakes, Tanganyika, Tulik Lake, Mono Lake, E5, um, Windermere, Loch Ness, Seneca Lake in New York, uh, Wintergreen in Lawrence in Southern Michigan, Trout Bog in Northern Wisconsin, Peter, Paul, oh darn, I'm gonna forget B right now, um, but Peter and Paul are in Northern Michigan. Um, these, are, these are like the maximum values of one over W that have been recorded. And the question that we can ask is, over climate change, would you stop seeing Tulik and Mono and E5 ever being in this regime with such intense mixing? And they would just shift down to a regime here with, with mostly mixing over on the boundary. And then the same kind of concept, those lakes that tend to, you know, that sometimes have their lowest value of one over W or lowest whatever number, would they shift it to be like these lakes, right? So you can see how the dynamics of the lake could really, really shift. Or um, let me just see where this goes next, yeah. So right now we could say would climate change cause them to shift, but right now we'll have, how can I say it? All of them start here. The wind comes up, they might go here, and the wind comes up here, we get that. But do we end up having lower winds or do we end up with stronger stratification for individual lakes that after you go from a non-windy period to a windy period, do you ever get back to this? So that would be a question that those of you in Gleon with long data sets could actually begin to, to answer. And now kind of summarizing, the frequency of events with low water burner lake number. So physical processes in lakes are coupled. So if winds are low and the lake number is high, heat is going to be stored in the upper, upper layers, the epilimnion. So a negative consequence is cyanobacterial blooms and a positive one is stable conditions for interactions across trophic levels. So if you're a zooplankton, you go, oh great, the wind stopped blowing, now I can eat those phytoplankton more readily, right? <laughs> That's what I mean by that. Um, so if the winds are high and the lake number is low, heat is mixed downwards. Now the habitat is unstable. And the consequences are gonna depend on whether the lake is eutrophic or oligotrophic. Um, and let's go back to that because if it's a eutrophic lake, we know that it, an oxygen, or the oxygen is going to be being drawn down in the hypolimnion. And so these events with low lake number can re-oxygenate that lower water column, right? So that's super, super important. Okay, now 
at this point, I just, you know, this is just a chance for me to show some cool um, remote, remote sense data by Yang Wei Sheng, how many lakes there are really in, in um, North America. I don't have the number here, but it's huge. Um, and if we have a few minutes extra for anybody who can stay, the next thing is once you start to get the physics down, now you're in a position to take advantage of some of the cool phase diagrams or some of the cool ratios that were developed by, and illustrated by Nauer et al. 2000 and O'Brien et al. in 2003. And these papers create phase diagrams which directly link the biology or the chemistry. Okay. And we're almost at the end of the time, and this is just too professorial. So I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> but I put this picture in again on this concept of time scales, because if you know how fast something happens, you can decide is the physics ruling or is the biogeochemistry ruling or is it the, the biology? And this is a um, a really nifty little diagram in Pernicke et al. 2014 that gives the time scales of mixing. And this one's the same one as I use. So it's L squared over KZ, and, and here we have four KZ, and we can argue which way is right. And the mixing then implied in the mixed layer, it's all based on the Kelvin Helmholtz billows. And then if it's an unstratified epilimnion, then it's the depth of the epilimnion divided by either the velocity scale from wind or the velocity scale from penetrative convection. And the equations for both are right here. And, and I, you know, grabbed Patricia's paper and get this and study it. It's beautiful. But into this question of are, you know, are like are all deep tropical lakes always meromictic? these next two get into the question of what causes deepening of the mixed layer. Okay, so this is a mixed layer problem. This is not the thermocline, but it's entrainment from above, <clears throat> right? So here we would have DHDT, right? The thickening of this layer over time depends on U star. So again, that's wind. And then here's a a gradient Richardson number, and I didn't have time in this lecture series to define that for you, but it is in the Mortimer paper I showed you right away, or send me a quick email. And then the one I think is also really important and which we've been using more in our work is how much the erosion depends on the cooling at the surface. And I showed you in that really nice data set from Lake Pleasant that the entrainment of the gases was occurring at night when we had um, the larger eddies that are set up by cooling. So the expression for that is the change in the depth of H over time depends on the buoyancy flux divided by this depth divided by N squared. And again, I didn't give you the equation for N squared or for B. Write to me, I can send you a PowerPoint or look them up in this paper. But if you've measured a surface energy budget and you have heat flux, you just have to throw in a coefficient of thermal expansion and a few other terms, and you have buoyancy flux. And then, and, and so how much deepening can occur then depends on how strong the stratification gradient is. And the best term to use for that is not a change in temperature or depth, but buoyancy frequency, okay? So that's what's really beautiful here. Um, are these types of time scales that let you go from, in some cases, simple physical measurements to how fast will change occur and what will that mean for my biology or biogeochemistry? Um, again, this is like a really cool set of graphs I just had to put in. And it was in the section on advice for you, for you guys. And one is, you know, do collaborative experiments and include sufficient instrumentation. And I mentioned to you, I just sometimes say to my postdocs or grad students, oh, just instrument the lake the way you want. And so this is N2, for which I showed you that little movie. And the little stars show everywhere they decided, as opposed to me, to put thermistor arrays. And then this is an example of what they were able to contour for 
the surface temperatures in a period with low wind, okay? With some cold water over on this side and warmer here. Um, and notice the temperature range, right? It's 9.4 to 9.5 degrees, so you need to have some accuracy in your instrumentation. But what we could see then is we had a setup for colder water in the near shore plunging down on top of the seasonal thermocline, right? So you can do a lot once you have some instruments. And that's why a lot of times physical oceanographers will all pool their instruments together and do a joint experiment. You know, not, okay, my leg. It's like, let's get enough instruments that we can solve a problem. And then this one is also pretty neat. It's the low cooling and high wind leads to upwelling. And once again, look at how small the temperature changes across the lake. The upwelling is here. The thermocline is down. I mean, the upper mixed layer is down well there. It's only 7.44 degrees here and 7.36 degrees there, which is 0.08 degree temperature difference. And here's what was going on within that lake, right? So the warmer water went over to one side and upwelled here, and then we had a little bit of a surface flow. Again, I put that in because of the interest in, um... <laughs> we have a visitor, <laughs> because of the interest in inshore offshore exchange, which would be so linked to oxic methane production or um, or are we getting the, the dissolved gases from the inshore? And then equations, which I won't take time. Some of you are interested in streams. I'll just take the minute to go through it. We might think a stream just comes straight into a lake. The modeling, this was done by Francisco Rueda. When the inflow comes into Tulip Lake, it actually mixes the whole of the first two basins. And then because it gets cold, it flows down into the seasonal thermocline, but because it gets windy as that stormwater is passing through the lake, in fact, the internal waves can be such that they drive the stream inflow over into other basins. So it's another example, the stream inflow, it wasn't just its density coming in, it's its density as it mixed with it initially with the receiving water, and then it will flow at, you know, a depth that's it, you know, the same density as what it is, but then it's acted on by the wind as it induces internal waves, causing these much more complicated patterns of flow. And um, so what's really important is I've given you kind of a historical overview of what we know, and I had to leave out a lot, but it's, you know, internal wave dynamics. And a lot of the really key research began in the 1960s, 1970s, and it's still going on. But your job is to come up with new questions. And can we develop any new ones based on the theory? And, and I've suggested that answering ecosystem levels, we could use time scale approaches. And so for the question, are mid-lake fluxes of methane due to oxic production or transport of methane produced in the sediments near shore, we can go back and look at the time scales that are given an hour at all. And they say, what's the time scale of evection from the near shore? Now they were doing arsenic, okay? Uh, but what's the time scale of evection from the near shore? What are the time scales of diffusive fluxes from the sediments? What's the rate of oxic meth methane production? What are the rates of methane oxidation? And what's the rate of loss across the air water interface? So as we answer those sorts of questions, then we can figure out how reasonable is it that the mid-lake fluxes of methane are due to locally produced um, methane in, in an oxygenated thermocline, or is it because of methane produced in sediments near shore, which then got mixed up near shore and then flowed out quickly near the surface? Important questions, really important questions. Um, so going back to it, um, using the approaches of Nowardow, and also I love O'Brien at 2003, but this is more of a chemical paper, based on the comparison of time scales of physical and biogeochemical processes, the dominant ones can be assessed. And now what I think is always so important is that you draw a sketch. 
right? Even, even this last slide where I said, what's the, how fast is the flow of the surface? What are the rates of, of entrainment from, of diffusion from the sediments? And then I showed you earlier a graph that if you have nonlinear internal waves, you can increase the rate of, of flux out of the sediments. Draw pictures, okay? And then once again, um, you know, thinking about this problem, what time scales can we obtain from principles in this lecture? Which ones from biogeochemistry? What measurements do we need to do? And now I say, it's time for you all to be creative. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of my talk. Um, I put in a couple of pictures, you know, from our winter limnology. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, and I, I won't do that. I'm going to stop my share. And, and then it's kind of nice because now I can actually maybe even see some of, of your faces. Um, and, but there were questions and I can see that it's nine o'clock. I mean, for me, it's nine in the morning. For you, it might be some is four in the afternoon. Um, but does anybody have any questions that they still want to ask at this point? Uh, Jim. First hey, of all, thanks. Oh, yeah, Jim, yeah, you still have the question in chat, right? So uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just curious from an operational standpoint, what for your Mount or your Mount Pleasant or Lake Pleasant example, what was the sampling frequency that you were able to see internal waves at? I mean, more is better, but what was sort of the minimum frequency? Jim, it's a it's a loaded question. And I'm <laughs> no. going to answer it. There's what I do, and there's what you can do. Okay, there's two different things. Because a lot of my experiments are short, relatively speaking. The paper I'm working on right now, we were only in the field for a week. So we sampled with the instruments as fast as we possibly could. Okay. In Tulip Lake, because the RBR um, instruments are now so much better than when I started out, I can sample with all of my loggers at 10 seconds. And now the solos you can sample at half a second. <laughs> we once tried to sample for the whole winter at the two seconds and it killed us, right? Because now you run into memory problems with your computers. And I did start off luckily with some higher resolution instruments. And I know I made a statement here that if you have the money, buy the higher resolution instruments. And WaterTemp Pros are about $100 and the RBR instruments are about 450 the last I looked. And that factor of four is gonna save an absolutely enormous amount of time, which translates into money. However, if you have like WaterTemp Pros, you can intercalibrate them. And I've worked with an awful lot of water temp pro data. And you just find periods of time when the water column is isothermal, or if you're really ambitious, you put them in a bucket ahead of time and you stir it really hard. And if you're really careful, you can get them not to have their reported accuracy of 0.2 degrees, you can get it down to 0.05. You can, I can't get it any better than that. They're also slow. Um, so you're going to see something that doesn't look mixed, but it's mixed because they have slow time constants. The other thing is they have a lot of digitization noise. And that means instead of a smoothly varying temperature, it goes dark, 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 dark. When we really want to push the limits with those instruments, we use a function called smooth a lot. And it's really nice because it smooths out all that digitization noise. And now you have a smooth temperature signal that you can much better use to intercalibrate the individual loggers at a time when you know the temperatures are all the same. Now, the issue of internal waves. Think about the periods of internal waves. This set of lectures, there wasn't time to do all the equations. Um, and in fact, I haven't memorized all the wave equations, so I just remember numbers from my own work. But in some of the smaller lakes in which I work, the period of the internal waves is only an hour. 
So you have to sample fast enough to be able to resolve that period. And, you know, I might say, okay, sample 10 times an hour, whatever that is. I guess that's every six minutes and that's your time constant of, a, of, a, of an onset, right? So you could do that. When you're trying to do a study where you want to really find out, did the internal waves cause mixing? Now you have to be sampling fast enough that when you do an energy spectrum, and I know you know what that means, and I know I haven't defined it for everybody else, but the energy spectrum gives energy on this axis and frequency on this axis, and the big motions have a lot of energy, and then there's typically a cascade from the large en energy, right? You'll have a, a diurnal wave, usually the wind picks up every day. You'll get one wave there with a peak, then it'll fall down, and then you get what Leon Bogman would call the gravity waves. And then when I make these graphs, I put in a line that indicates the buoyancy frequency. So that's gravity divided by density times a density gradient. Yeah. Um, and then I have to take the square root of it. On the other side of that line, if you find that you have a peak in the spectrum, that tells you that those internal waves became nonlinear, they broke, and the water column became turbulent. The time scale of those motions varies with stratification. I'm just going to give you a ballpark number right now, two minutes. So if you want to see that, now you've got to be sampling much faster than the two minutes. But if you were just trying to get the normal internal wave field, you don't have to sample at 10 second intervals, right? And, and you can just think, you know, we always think, how much battery life do we have? What's the length of our deployment? What's a reasonable interval? But I always find that I'm much happier when I use better quality instruments and when I sample fast, but not under the ice necessarily at two times a second or even two seconds, because then we can't work with the data. D does that answer the question well enough? Yeah, yeah that's just, really helpful. Thanks. Yeah, but I just want to encourage people, even if you don't have the most expensive equipment, if you're careful, you can get a story and way back when, you know, I'm just so old <laughs> that I used to build my own thermistors, okay? Or I'd buy a thermistor and I'd pot it. I made my own arrays and we bought data loggers, you, you, you know, and, and that was a lot cheaper than some of the things we do today, right? There's a lot of strategies. I had to use a mercury thermometer in a bath and stir, you know, to try to calibrate. There wasn't any company I could send my instruments to to be recalibrated. And I would bring those water baths down onto those lakes in the tropics and stir, you know, probably had a spin bar. And that's how I did the inner calibration. So there are a lot of things you can do to be creative to try to get the best quality data you can when you don't have the world's best instrumentation. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Hans Peter. I think he had to leave, but uh, he still would like to hear your opinion on how important OMP could be versus the vertical movement of littoral methane. <laughs> so he wants me to be recorded to give the answer, huh? <laughs> hey, look, guys, I didn't even have a chance to add in another new video. Um, but in my lab, we have a really good modeler right now by the name of Wen Wenchai Zhou. And he's using a model called AIM3D, which is the follow-up model of LCOM coming out of the Center of Water Research. And we're working in a lake that Samantha would find of interest is poly, polymictic at, at low water. And it is phenomenal because um, I'm trying to push the envelope. Some of the gas transfer people aren't in the room anymore, at least the ones I know aren't, aren't here anymore. But we're trying to push the envelope on how fast are the current speeds at the very surface that would support higher uh, gas transfer velocities. And it is amazing once you start to get a surface velocity with a model that they're ripping along at 20 centimeters per second. So the rate of exchange from the near shore to the offshore can be very fast. But that is not going to answer Hans Peter's question. Okay, this is just an observation from one model that we're doing. And you've got to totally be thinking about the rates of all these different processes in order to come up with a good answer to that. Okay, does anybody else have any questions left? 
So the one thing, Margie, do I say your name right? Yeah, it's really good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, I, I, I spent some time last night. Um, I found one of my Tanganyika pictures and, oh, I could just send it to you. Um, Margie's interested in are all tropical lakes myrmectic? Well, I think the question really is, are all deep tropical lakes myrmectic? That, that's it, right? Yeah. And, and um, does anybody here want to take a gander on that question? Maybe just to specify a little bit, I, there's talk that like, because there's not much air temperature variation around the equator, um, oh it's, it's just myrmectic. <laughs> Oh my, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, so look, um, I didn't bring, I, I did a study on Lake Victoria and that, my goodness, that was a difficult study. Um, ultimately, I had, there's so few meteorological stations in East Africa. Ultimately, I had to work with reanalysis data, but in the southeast monsoon, and this is now Victoria, for those of you who don't know the East African Great Lakes, some are extraordinarily deep, like Tanganyika at 1,000 meters, Malawi at 650, uh, Kivu's um, 540. Lake Victoria is anomalous in that regard, in that its maximum depth is 80 meters, okay? But it's not anomalous in, in terms of the meteorology. The southeast trade, the monsoon, we have a monsoon season, right? The intertropical conversion zone goes back and forth and back and forth. And in what I call the southeast monsoon, which is in May, June, July, into August, the winds are coming off the Indian Ocean. And then for Victoria, they're coming across Tanzania, which is a dry country. So that air is very dry, okay? And the wind is reasonably strong, okay? What that means is that there's a huge amount of latent heat flux, a lot of evaporation on the south end of Lake Victoria. As the winds flow over the lake, they pick up moisture. That means that the evaporation on average, like it's a monthly average, is three times less to the north, okay? The effect of that cooling is it strips heat from Victoria at the south end. So it's not really all about air temperature. It's about how dry is the air and how strongly is it blowing, right? What are the wind speeds that are then gonna cause that cooling? The other part of the question is, as those winds are blowing, now they are sustained in one direction. The tropical lakes, as many lakes to have, have a diurnal wind cycle, right, depending on whether the lake is warmer than the surrounding land. But during the southeast monsoon, you know, you do have a strong prevailing wind and it depresses the thermocline. So if, if I, if anybody wants, if they have the patience for me to refine the picture I put up last night for um, Lake Tanganyika, the combination, so what you've got now is a combination. You've got a whole lot of cooling at the south end of the lake because of, of increased latent heat fluxes and you have the wind, which is depressing the thermocline, and those are the processes that are causing the cold water to upwell at the southern end of the basin. Does that help as a first cut on that? You know, I even, him, him, I mean, I can get it, but you know, I can see what time it is. Um, I have my Tanganyika slides up, or just one picture hidden in the background, and I have a model of Kivu showing that same upwelling, but I did just describe it. So the fact that the air temperatures are changing a lot, and you really should read some of Towling's paper or Towling and Lemoyal, because he has this beautiful introduction saying, it's a part of the world where the solar radiation doesn't vary as much, the air temperatures don't vary as much, but the latent heat fluxes and cloud cover, right? They vary a lot, and that's your setup for these differences in the seasonal behavior and also your setup for whether or not you're gonna have deep mixing. And then there's the other question of would increased salts be required to mix the 
you know, the East African Great Lakes Deep Lake. And I've actually never even seen the connectivity profile from those lakes, which really surprises me, but I never have. Um, but I think, it, but part of the reason I put in those time scales from the Pernica et al. paper is that if you know the buoyancy flux, like how much heat is being lost, and you know the density gradient, you could figure out whether or not, you know, how deeply you can entrain in that water column. Okay, does that help? as a first cut for answering that, and we could correspond further if you wanted. Yeah, this is great, thank you. Yeah, and John V, I hope it helps. You know, I, <laughs> I have this beautiful model showing for Kiva in the back, but I hate just flipping around on my screen and you guys all have to wait for me to find things that I can. Yeah. Yeah. Sally, I have a, I have a question, uh, or a couple questions actually, so there was, one simulation you showed um, with uh, backscatter and sediment resuspension from the bottom. I forget who that was by. Is there any field studies that correspond that show similar sediment resuspension with um, deepening layers or reduction in the lake number? Okay, so the same group, so Leon Bogman, one or two of his graduate students have actually done work on that problem. But okay. I would say that that's one of the problems with lake number that has not been investigated enough. And, and I think it's hard. You know, I sort of want to do it in Mono Lake, but you have this challenge because you've got this moving water, right? And so you might be moving oxygen back and forth, but then you want to get a flux from the sediments. So how do you get it if you're, you know, if your scalars are sloshing back and forth? So it's a little hard. But that backscatter um, technique, that anytime you've got a current meter out there, for instance, I know you have a signature 1000, you could look at the backscatter signal from that and you could see if there was any increase in particulates during times that are windier. And then you might go, well, if I'm seeing those particulates, now, another thing that's always really important, you have to remember that the near bottom of lakes often has a flocculent layer. And mm -hmm. so nobody's also looked at the issue of does this flocculent layer itself move back and forth? So you'd have to be super careful. Am I seeing something in one dimension or am I really just watching the movement of a layer? Okay, so that, that would make it trickier. You'd have to really do some extra work looking at the combination with your thermistors and the backscatter signal to interpret when do I really see that increase and it's just because we've caused some mixing near the bottom. But again, Leon has some beautiful, beautiful images of internal waves as they curl over. And then there's a term we use called vorticity, which is the amount of twisting of the water. And that when those waves are in that on um, going over the, the bent that bottom layer, you have this massive amount of vorticity, which could then really suck things out of the sediments, but it really hasn't been worked on, other okay. than, to my knowledge, Leon's group. Got it. Yeah, we've had some deployment problems, and because there's about two meters of muck at the bottom of the lake, and so, yeah, yeah there could be sloshing back and forth or upwelling of those sediments, um, but yeah, that would be a really interesting thing to look at. In terms of arsenic and other gases, yeah, or gases yeah. in general, absolutely. Yeah. Well, look. Th does anybody else have some questions? Or those of you who are here, would you be willing to sort of like say what your work is on? You know, if we have a few more minutes. So I kind of have like a blue sky question, Sally. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, just, and I think you kind of got to this at the end, but like, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. So I'm usually from the biology side of things. Um, but I love at least like thinking about the, the physical processes that, that are influencing the biology. Um, but my question is like, for, if you're starting in like a new system or a lot of systems where like, you don't necessarily have the data to inform the physical processes and you're interested in like these coupling, um, tasks and you're maybe you're not necessarily trained in the physical processes um how do you like get in how do you um 
get into that or like set up those experiments in that or in field studies in that way. And the only thing that I could think of was like collaborating with the people that do it. But well, um, well actually nowadays, I think that's a good starting point. But I will tell you, so when I tell it, I do think everybody should read that Mortimer paper. But I have to, and as I said in the beginning, I only got halfway through. I couldn't even get to the internal waves. It was decades till I got the internal waves. Um, but I remember on our one of our first experiments on Mono Lake, I was with Jeff Schlado from UC Davis, who has much more training in physical limnology than I have. And Jeff said, so you can't put your thermistor chain here. You're in the center of the lake. You're never going to, you know, because remember, in the center, you don't have the change in, in up and down. Well, oh, yeah, Jeff, you're right. So we went over and put it by the boundary. But when you start, you just do temperature and oxygen measurements, and it may be a handheld profiler, you, you know. And I was thinking also this giving this talk reminded me when John and I started, we were camping on the lake on which we worked, and we took temperature and oxygen measurements every three hours except at three in the morning. And I thought, man, what a different world now where you just put out your time, you know, your temperature and your oxygen sensors in there all summer, <laughs> right? But just start, the other thing you guys don't know is that I'm a biologist first, and then I learned all this physics in order to answer biological questions. Um, and so there's a huge difference between me and my quantitative knowledge than let's say Johnny Roost or Jorg Imberger or Andreas Lorke. I mean, the, their ability to you know, work with the numbers and equations far exceeds mine. But even in grad school, well, I had this book, I don't know why I have it, it's called A First Course in Turbulence by Tenekas and Lumley, also published when I started grad school. In the first chapter, they say a really important thing is develop intuition. And I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> you know, and most of this book is really hard for me, okay, even though I know a lot more about turbulence now than in the past. But by spending the time actually looking at data and thinking about it, that's how I developed the intuition, right? If I came in with, you know, as a applied mathematician or, or or whatever, I might be able to read all the equations and go, oh, this is what should happen. But I can read the equations and kind of get ideas. And then I can look at my field data and I can do some stuff going back and forth. I think it just takes patience. But sort of ask, what are you interested in? And, and maybe it's the microbiology. So many now are really keen on microbiology, but say, look, it's gonna ma matter what the thermal structure is. And if you're working under ice, be sure to measure conductivity because under the ice, the conductivity is such an extremely important component of density. Okay, did that help? Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I would love to hear what everyone is working on. I think that was a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, yeah, would be nice to do a, a quick round. I can, I can start. Um, I work on modeling using process-based models to look at effects of extreme weather events. I am using mostly one-dimensional models, so this presentation I was like, oh, I should really consider more. Um, but mostly, both uh, interested in in physics and bi and biogeochemistry. So yeah, I really like this interaction. Hi. In my next, <laughs> well, I'm Anna and I'm based in the UK. I'm currently working with climate change projections and looking at how uh, climate change models will, how meteorological factors will affect the, uh, um, the uh, physics of the uh, water bodies in aquatic system. And I'm doing it currently uh, for the uh, British lakes and uh, canals, the rivers, transitional systems. But my background is actually, I'm a biologist. <laughs> I'm a biologist who moved into physics. And uh, I, I did um, like profiling back in uh, 2005. It was a large um, oligotropic lake um, with, a mass, uh, with, a, in, with an impressive saddle in, in the middle. So it, it's um, one of those glacial lakes, which is deep and yeah, it's got saddle. And so all this fantastic curvature of the, um, of the uh, mixing layer that just uh, reminded some of the uh, 
interesting profiles that I've seen in the past. So thank you, Sally. That was that was impressive. And by the way, I I'm really excited about the research. Thank you. It's really <laughs> yeah yeah enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi everyone. I'm Jean Vertuisenge uh, from Rwanda, currently based in the Netherlands, and I'm actually working on Lake Kivu. I'm interested in assessing on how the cage waste, cage fish farming waste, are dispersed in the Lake Kivu and how the they can they may contribute to changes in this lake. So I'm very much uh, interested in those processes that Sari explained. And yeah, thank you, sir, for the presentation. I think I will come back to you with um, many questions. My first uh, my first objective is actually on mixing dynamics. So. I will see which of these coefficient I can uh, put in my research and which one can help me to understand better how this uh, cage waste disperse in the lake. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, so I'm Michael Meyer. I'm a PhD candidate at Washington State University, um, and I largely focus on understanding uh, benthic food web ecology in response to like low level sewage pollution. So working in pretty remote lakes. Um, so merging things or remote, I say remote, uh, it's not really remote, <laughs> um, the, uh, less urban environments. So things like in Montana, um, as well as in Siberia. Um, merging like pharmaceutical pharmaceutical data with like fatty acids, um, stable isotope data to get an idea of food web restructuring. Michael, that's re really cool. Who are you working? Um, uh, is it like Washington State? Like, I mean, which one? I'm at, I'm in the Pullman campus. I work with Stephanie. Oh, we, we do. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were at the um, the AG. I chat. remember. Yes. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> we had a great conversation. Yeah, great yeah, but you can think about yours in inshore offshore exchange. Yeah, and that's why oh. I put those couple last little figures in because mm -hmm. they were amazing how much inshore offshore exchange occurs that you wouldn't even know if you didn't have the instruments out there, right? Mm -hmm. And you might be able to do that with oxygen cheaper. There might be some other ways, but that's really cool. Well, yeah. and sorry, not to not to hog time or anything, but yeah, I just kept thinking because, um, like, you know, in thinking about like how frequently do you take samples, what time scales are the processes or the the um, like the processes that are governing governing these changes occurring? I, you know, I was naive like in 2017, and I thought that I could take enough samples to can uh, to um, to capture like these pharmaceutical loadings, yeah. and it's like you just get really messy data at the end of the day. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's just something that's always on the back burner. I can go. Um, also, yes, 2020 hindsight in field work and thinking that you should have done something three years ago is the hardest thing. Um, I'm Sam. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I'm studying shallow lakes that have um, high concentrations of arsenic in the sediments. So studying a lot of um, bottom processes and convection. Small lakes are, those small lakes I'm studying are mostly mixed by convection. So yeah, it's really interesting talk and yeah, so many things to think about and process. So thanks, Sally. I guess I can go next. Um... So my name is Maartje, I'm based in Montreal, um, and so I work on physical lake processes, uh, but on a global scale. Um, so this kind of temperature and salinity and then mixing, seasonal mixing regimes. Um, 
yeah, but this this talk is super interesting for me to understand the mixing dynamics, but it's also very challenging for me because I know that all the nuances uh, taught to me here, I won't, like I have to generalize uh, a lot to be able to work on a global scale. Um, so I kind of have to pick out those that are important on that scale and those that are more, more local. Uh, so very interesting. Uh, thank you. Martin, who are you working with? Uh, it's Bernard Lehner. Um, he created the Hydro Lakes uh, data set. So it's, it's mostly, I was kind of brought in to work exclusively with that data set. Okay. And are, are, are you at like University of Quebec, Montreal? Uh, it's McGill actually. Oh, you're at McGill. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Hey, Shu, should I come next? Yes, please. Okay, so my name is Ben Dokuvie. I'm from Uganda, but now I'm based in Germany and working with Hans Peter Grozat. And my I've just begun my PhD two months into it, and I'll be studying the role of the pycnocline in microbial degradation. And what we are we're looking at here is, does this pycnocline really trap these particles? We are hypothesizing that the pycnocline does trap quite a wide diversity and number of aggregates within it. And with it trapping them, we have microbial colonization, which drives the degradation of recastrant organic matter. And we, we, we just want to, to to see whether this really does happen in, in within the lake. Yeah. Cool. Hey, I, I don't think I ever told you guys, but my first two years before graduate school, I worked in East Africa. And we were supposed to go to Uganda. Uh, it's such a long time ago. The way I always think of it, it's the time when Idi Amin came. And, and all of a sudden, it wasn't safe for us to go anymore. So we ended up, we thought about working in Ethiopia. We ended up working in Kenya. Um, but I was lucky enough also to be able to travel to Tanzania. And I've only been in Uganda in the airport, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Although even though doing the study on Lake Victoria, um, I worked with the data that came to me as opposed to being based in Jinja. Um, yeah. But I have a, you know, a tremendous interest. Um, that, that's just an aside. Hey, one other thing, if you can remember it all from that very first movie of Ben Hodges, and, and in that one, you could see the hypolimnion just coming way up on the side of the lake. Imagine that that hypolimnion is also carrying particulates. And then you get some mixing on the side and an intrusion which would flow into the picnic line. So I'm mentioning that simply because it may not only be particulates raining down from above, you could also have a supply because of those events and coming in. And your inverter now really doesn't even think that the boundary mixing causes a, a flux. And I've gone back and looked at some of my, the first paper I wrote on that topic and I went, it might not have caused much transport. And York thinks that the exchange is really when you get that hypolimetic water coming up and you, you're gonna have to have some mixing, okay? It's gotta happen to change the density, but then you get that intrusion that flows offshore. So keep that in mind as another source of supply for things in the in the picnic line. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And perhaps you you do some other studies within Uganda. We have lots of oh, lakes. I would love it. Yeah. yeah and my <laughs> husband has. You know, he's published. <laughs> yeah. And I correspond. You know, with people there in Jinja and Kampala. You know. Yeah. Yeah. We have Ted. I'll go. Next. So and, Sally, and thank you so much. I missed day two talk. I was on a pond scum tour. Uh, and that's because I live in Kansas and we have many scummy ponds. So sorry I missed that. But uh, really, I'm, a, I'm a, a biologist or chemical limnology, but I more and more have to play <laughs> some sort of engineer or physical modeler within my lab or at least find those people. So this talk was just so great that you broke it down. So I just wanted to thank you. Um, and yeah, I'm Ted. I work at the Kansas Biological Survey here in Lawrence, Kansas, and we study large and small reservoirs. And uh, really, 
kind of how I got on the physical side is because I figured the chemistry is always right for blooms here. We got plenty of phosphorus <laughs> and we grow plenty of crops in the watershed. We grow them in our lakes too. And the biology is always right. And so it really just became clear to me that because all those other factors line up for cyanobacteria blooms to happen, it really is the physical part that we were missing. There was not a lot of data collected in Kansas yet. So I've also gotten into the buoys and we have a number on a number of our, our large lakes that are Turns out polymictic, not dimictic, like all the linologists thought that were here before. And so it's just awesome to see the polymictic slides as well, because that was something that perplexed me at first, or at least was like, whoa, how do I deal with this? So seeing that there are so many other lakes where we have data sets super similar to the reservoirs we have here in Kansas, at least with thermodynamics, was just great to see. And yeah, so just really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, that's cool. You know, Ted, did you get an award one time from SIL? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, maybe. I think I was asked to be the, the American on, on something in a larger contest, but yeah, that was on <laughs> persistent organic pollutants. So I've done a lot of different things <laughs> within my short career, seemingly. Yeah, no, I think that, no, I don't know that you and I have ever met, but I, I recognized your name. And I think you must have applied for something at SIL when I was like the vice president dealing with all these awards. And if you didn't get one, I'm surprised because you were way up there on the list. <laughs> well, well, that's good to know. And I'll just have to thank Val for that, right? So I'm a Val Smith student. So yeah. you know, a lot of the a lot of the resource uh, talk comes comes from being his student. So mm -hmm. thank cool. you. And, and we have one more. Sh Shuki Lin. If you're still there, and I saw Yoakum, Yoakum vanished. <laughs> he, he must not have wanted to introduce himself, but he was a graduate student with Patrick Krill, working on methane in lakes in the Stortle and Meyer, and I collaborated with him on some papers. And we just finished a paper on winter limnology that it includes, you know, it's a review paper, so it's got results of lots and lots of people, but we highlighted a little bit of work that Alicia Cortez and I had done in those lakes around Tulik, and then we included a lot of work that Yoakum had done on the under ice methane. Um, so he just disappeared, but he's, he's also great, just like everybody else. Yeah. Okay, what do you think? You, you know, I, 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 I brought up my picture of the time series from, from Tanganyika, but I think maybe in the interest of time, I should just email that to Marchi rather than <laughs> show you guys more pictures of upwelling and internal waves. Um, and and um, if you guys ever have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to write. And I guess we have that next Gleon meeting coming up, you know, pretty soon. And it would be pretty cool, in, in, you know, I. As far as I know, I registered. And so it'd be nice to interact again. It, you know, it really helps once I begin to know people's names, then I begin to, one, I get your papers on ResearchGate, you know, I go, oh yeah. <laughs> um, and, anyhow, it's really nice to set up a dialogue. Yeah. And this yeah. whole business of climate modeling in lakes is very, very challenging. And it's something that we're trying to do too with in the Amazon, right? The spatial modeling lakes of different size. In our case, we're looking at methane production and some of the CO2, but very similar types of things. And what are the shortcuts you need to take? And do you need to be doing diurnal cycles? So in the tropics, so much happens over diurnal cycles that you can't go, oh, I can work with a, a daily average value of wind. That won't work. But sometimes you have to take those shortcuts in order to make sure that the data is manageable and the model will run. You know? So another thing I'll mention is a, a paper that was recently published on a model called multi-basin diarism. And this was partially motivated because running the 3D models just takes so long. And maybe they get some more of the physics right over the long term. Sometimes they have to be recalibrated as they go along. And the 1D models, because you know the computational costs are less, you can run them much longer in the future. But multi-basin diarism was developed in order to be able to take into account the fact that basin morphometry 
can affect the flows, right? And so you subdivide a lake into different pieces. Each is exposed to the um, surface energy budget, which then creates conditions where this part's hotter or this part's colder, and then the lateral flows that result. And it runs super fast. So anyhow, that paper just came out and, and, and one of their goals was maybe to have a model like that used in some of the future climate projections. And Wen Chai Zhou is the first author and Yorg Inberger and Kuli and Marti are other co-authors. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Does anybody have any more questions or should we call it a day? Yeah, if there are no more questions, I think, yeah, I would just like to close off by thanking you a lot for all these great lectures. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I think we all we all did. Um, yeah. I also heard a lot of uh, requests for the recordings and uh, a lot of interest. So yeah, thanks again. Uh, okay. It was really amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, one other thing that's helpful, David Hamilton and I are, well, John Small and Ian Jones are leading the charge for revision of Wetzel's limnology. And David Hamilton and I are doing the chapters on the fate of heat and water movements. And we're a bit slow, but we haven't gotten any reminder messages recently. It will get done. And Warwick Vincent just wrote me the other day that the Civil Education Committee is going to have all of us who have written chapters and the number of authors, the way it's being, the way the text is being revised is to have specialists in each field revise the chapters. So we have oxygen and we have methane and we have Tanya Del Santro. And I mean, the cast of characters is really pretty amazing, but they're gonna to try to have each of us do a bit of a tutorial. So that will also be helpful, okay? Um, so just, <laughs> supposed to come out next year, but some of us still, still have to finish our writing. Yeah. Anyhow, look, so I'm going to look forward to seeing you at the Gleon meeting. And I do appreciate that you came and I really appreciate the questions. And if you have more, be in touch. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Sure. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah. My pleasure. <laughs>